So in this book, Berard is drawing on quantum physics and specifically the work of Niels Bohr and call the ways that quantum physics calls into question the entire tradition of so-called Western metaphysics, the belief that the world is populated with individual things, with their own independent sets of properties that are pretty determinate, and instead asserting the ways that properties become determinate through different apparatuses, different methods of observation and, me and measurement, different configurations of material conditions and what we call experiment and all these different ways that we generate knowledge. And so in other words, part of what Berard is asserting, well, part of what, what quantum physics is asserting is that what something is, its ontology depends upon how we attempt to know it, its epistemology or the epistemology with which we're approaching it. And like a famous quantum physics experiment is the difference between a wave and a particle that the same thing is uh, exists differently depending on how we observe it. Mm -hmm. And so if that's true, if there aren't things that are separate from the methods of observation or the methods of engagement with them, and that the, the object of knowledge is always in some way implicated in the conditions through which that knowledge is created, then there's a certain inseparability of all of these different factors that are part of the process or the project of knowledge production, such that we're not separate from the knowledge we're producing. The, if we think about this in the context of astrology, there's an inseparability or an entanglement between us and the planets and the, the books of translations that have been passed down through generations and the computers that generate our charts and the internet through which we engage with our clients or in this podcast and so on. Like all of these different mm, factors are part of not only that which we know, but also that which we are knowing through those processes of engagement it just makes you think very much like how how necessary a you-ness is like you are here mm -hmm. and you are participating in this with others and we're all connected and then what part of you is you and what part of your chart is you and then maybe defamiliarizing that and softening mm -hmm. the gaze a bit and having a different awareness I mean it's just it's it's wonderful honestly but I see what you mean like and, and it makes me think also of when we're Rick Levine will always um love quoting this when he says well the moon isn't actually there it's a wave mm. until we look at it right I, I love that you use the word participate that we're participating in because I, that's very much how I think about astrology that I think when people ask me like what is astrology I more often than not say that astrology is an assemblage of agencies that are both human and more than human, that's always emerging from a cloud of determinacy and indeterminacy. It's very much a human practice of co-creating meaning with the more than human. Most notably, the sky, the planets, the stars, the asteroids, light, motion, but also our place here on Earth, but also the body with which we're witnessing all of this. Like anything that we interpret in astrology was made available to us through the particular sensory motor apparatus of our bodies, our eyes, our visual senses, um, but also language and myth and archetypes and technology and social systems and cultural biases. And let's not forget mystery, the mm -hmm. great mystery of how does any of this work? How is how the we might even say the magic of all of this like all of this is part of the apparatus that or the assemblage that astrology is um which is to say i think that astrology is um always more or actually no i would even go as far as to say it's never been simply a practice of decoding mm -hmm. unilateral messages from sky gods as if there's a, a singular message and it's and it's our job to apply techniques to it in order to find the right interpretation of that or the decoding of that message, that it is actively a co-creative process that we are participating in with the, the sky and the earth and all of these other agencies that are part of the meaning making meaning making practice that we're engaging in.
Mm-hmm. And there's a wheel, right? And, and and if we're looking at like the map as an entry point into this territory, which is not the map, obviously, but when you start to see this, you know, because I'm going back to what you said, Barad said about the the individual, right? We share zodiacal degrees. And when you see enough charts, you kind of realize that there's nothing special about having, you know, your son at zero cancer or or 19 cancer. And you start to see other people have things there too. And you're like, wait, but that's mine. And it's like, well, is it yours? You're sharing this. A lot of people's, I mean, we, we can only have placements in certain places. And then you start to study time of a century, for example, the 20th century. And it's like at, after a certain point, you're not surprised to see Uranus conjunct Pluto and Virgo because anyone born in the 60s has that. So now you realize like, oh, that it, even just seeing that piece of data lets you extrapolate like, oh, that individual must have been born at this time because that's the address for that, right? Temporal address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then... If we go back to the 1700s and see Jean-Baptiste Morin de Villefranche, the last great French astrologer of the traditional school before everything went underground for a couple hundred years, he says that if someone is indicated in the seventh house to have, you know, a certain kind of other in relationship, they will always find someone suitable to fill that role. Hmm. So through the lens of the tradition, actually, we don't have that sense of I or the individual because there is a way to fold the chart data such that you start to see how other people show up in your life very, very literally and explicitly. Mm -hmm. Like, what does your preferred other look like? What does your dog or her cat look like, right? Like, you can actually get to these, like, very specific interpretations of the relationality between a certain type of role that, that any kind of relationship can play in your life and then how that plays itself out and how people who are not you, are relating to each other through your vantage point, mm -hmm. right? So I really love that. Um, it, I've never thought about how that traditional approach to the chart actually kind of speaks to a pre-existing entanglement in a way, because, you know, in, in that sentence from Villefranche is like, yeah, you'll always find somebody to do your seventh house with that's appropriate yeah. for that role. Well, and part of what Barad talks about and part of what we part of what comes out of quantum physics is that relations precede separable objects, that they are not objects that then enter into relationships. There are relations, and then within those relations of entanglement or what Barad talks about as intra-activity, not interactivity, intra-activity within the relation, those seemingly separable persons or objects come into existence through that relationship. And I think that's so clearly demonstrated in the chart that I, I actually don't think the chart is a description of an individual per se, as much as it is the description of a life mm -hmm. that is composed of countless relations, of which, as you said, there is a vantage point, a perspective of the native um, described by the ascendant, but then everything else in the chart is describing the ways that that life is constituted in and through these relations that maybe become inhabited by different people or different experiences at different times. But yeah, I think that inherent relationality and entanglement might be in astrology all along. 